Good morning. Welcome to the Community Voice. Yesterday marked the 21st anniversary of the 9-11 attacks against the United States of America by radical Islamic terrorists known as Al-Qaeda, led by Osama bin Laden and al-Zawahiri, both eliminated years later by the United States. The following times, Tuesday morning of that day, will always be in our memory. At 8.46 a.m., the first airliner hit the World Trade Center North Tower. At 9.03 a.m., the South Tower was struck. At 9.37 a.m., the Pentagon was struck. At 9.59 a.m., the World Trade Center South Tower collapsed. At 10.07 a.m., Flight 93 crashes in Pennsylvania. And at 10.28 a.m., the North Tower of the World Trade Center collapsed. What are those people gonna do? All the elevators are blocked out. Oh my god, so both towers are now... Okay, now we can talk to you. I got an aircraft that's out east of the White House. Hello? Crystal City, just north of Crystal City. Just to the north of your town. Yeah, stop all the parkers. The Pentagon just got hit. Don't put me in that. Can't even protect my NCA. United 93, that traffic three is 1 o'clock, 12 miles eastbound, 370. Negative contact, we're looking, United 93. Hey. United 93, Cleveland, if you hear the center right then. I got that piece of dog. Keep it amazing to be. We have a ball of wood. United 93, have you got information on that yet? Yeah, he's down. He's down? Yes. When did he land? He did not land. Oh, he's down? Yes, yeah, somewhere up northeast of Camp David. Sean, it's me. I just want to let you know I love you, and I'm stuck in my building in New York. because you got to help each other get off the floor. I'm now. Die. <laughs> a new type of war. That's what it is. The attacks that day took the lives of 2,997 U.S. citizens, including 340 fire service personnel and 72 law enforcement officers. Brian Hightower of the Hightower Funeral Homes is our guest this morning. On a national level, Brian is the immediate past president of the National Funeral Directors Association Board of Directors. His national service also includes serving as a member of the Disaster Mortuary Operational Response Team for nearly 15 years. These teams are comprised of private citizens, each with a particular field of expertise, who are now activated in the event of a disaster. Bryant drove to New York City shortly after the terrorist attacks and spent three months there. He serves as the Family Assistance Center contacting families of the people who were on the planes. He also worked with the medical examiner to put together post-mortems so remains could be identified. Bryant, thanks for coming in and want to get your thoughts uh, as we remember that Tuesday morning 
9-11-2001. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you. Uh, on the anniversary of 9-11, uh, that fateful day that uh, folks in my generation certainly will always remember, uh, my thoughts always drift back to the families. Uh, as you mentioned, I served for several weeks uh, in my deployment uh, as a member of the uh, family assistance team, uh, talking to families, gathering anti-mortem information that could be used down the road by the medical examiner's office as hopefully he was able to make identifications and return those loved ones to their families. Um, and over that course of those several weeks, uh, created some bonds with several of those families because there was a need to talk to them several different times. And my thoughts always go back to them and wonder you know, what their lives are like today and how they've recovered. Let's, let's, uh, before we take our break, let me ask you one other thing. I understand you spoke to a church last evening. So this, keeping the memory of this alive, as we say, never forget, is important. Yes, it is. Um, and uh, I was fortunate enough to, to speak to Bethel East Baptist Church last night in a service that they had to remember 9-11 and honor first responders. And, uh, you know, as somebody who participated in the recovery efforts after 9-11, uh, at least for me, it's always been better to be surrounded by others as we remember than it has been to try to uh, go through that day alone. Uh, having the support of others and, and recognizing the loss that day and in some small way trying to remember those almost 3,000 people that lost their lives has been important for me over the last 21 years. We're going to take a break. we got a lot more we want to talk about with Brian. But first, let's hear from our sponsors. Health is a journey. It's making better choices, even when it's not easy. It's taking care of yourself and the people you love. At Tanner Health System, we're there for you with every step, with primary care, heart care, cancer care, women's care, orthopedics, surgical services, and so much more. We're dedicated to helping you live and feel your best. So let's get on that journey to health. You've got places to be for many years to come. Find us at Tanner.org. As a believer in the power of education, we are called to set the standard by shaping and empowering the minds of future generations through quality education. Oak Mountain Academy embraces this philosophy, which is why my children attend this prestigious school. I am elated to serve on the OMA Board of Trustees, where together we prepare students and remind them to trust and believe in the power to transform the world. I'm Dr. Brian Bain, inviting you to celebrate our 60-year legacy of academic excellence. Visit us at oakmountain.us. Good morning. Welcome back to the Community Voice. I'm Steve Graddick, your host. We're ascribing to Never Forget regarding the 9-11 attacks. That, that, uh, it was a beautiful Tuesday morning, I remember back mm -hmm. then. Um, being a funeral director yeah, with the Hightower Family Funeral Homes, I've always wondered, and I know I'm, I've had this experience in my life, but if, there, if there's not a body, the grieving process is different. Uh, and there were many, many families that were not given any remains, correct? That's right, Steve. Uh, the last information that I saw um, indicated that there's over a 1,000 individuals whose remains were never identified and returned to their families. Uh, and there was one uh, case in particular while I was working at the ME's office, and uh, one of the detectives I was working with had interviewed this lady uh, to gather information. She'd lost her husband who worked at Cantor Fitzgerald and uh, her comment to him was you've got to return my husband to me because I've got a three-year-old I want to lay him to rest at a place where I can tell my son about his father um, while I was there we we were able to the ME's office was able to make an identification and return him to her but that was the most important thing to her at that point in time uh, the loss was certainly undeniable and significant but she knew down the road that they needed a place. And um, I've, I've wondered about that little boy many times and how many discussions and how many talks he and his mom probably had at that graveside. How much, I mean, you were there three months, and how much of this is a, would be appropriate to tell us or to share with us? You know, we heard that, as you said, a thousand were not recovered at all. Obviously, I've heard the term you know, bodies were vaporized. I imagine on some there was just maybe one 
one small remain. How how did how did that as much as you can share? How much of that uh, did you go through, and how do you how do you do that? You know, I I think um, looking back on it, um, you know, and there were some real heroes uh, at Ground Zero in those recovery efforts. I worked for a, for a time at the temporary morgue facility there at Ground Zero for about two weeks during that three month deployment, and. Um, you know the guys on that pile, on that rubble pile, uh, were, were were by and large MOS members of service. They were firemen and policemen, and they did some heroic work. They really did. Um, but they understood how important it was to try to re- to recover those remains and hopefully return them to their families. But as any any catastrophic event, we had you know certainly whole body recoveries, and then there were partial bodies that were recovered. And again, hopefully. Uh, can eventually be uh, returned to their families. But um, I think about those guys, too, because you, you realize all the health effects now that many of them are suffering with. So not only did that 2,977 people lose their lives, but we've had a number of other MOS members who have succumbed to the after effects of that 9-11 debris field. So it's it continues to take lives. Tell us more, not only about the fire department in New York and New York PD, but the DMORC volunteers. I mean, that must have been uh, incredible to be in the same field with these other individuals working. It, you know, it, it was really humbling uh, to watch them work. Um, and as you mentioned, DMORC is a multi uh, vocational uh, group. Uh, we have forensic odontologists, pathologists, funeral directors lab techs, fingerprint specialists. Uh, it's it's a team, truly a team effort. And we were sent there to uh, support uh, the medical examiner's office in the city of New York, who was probably more um, able to deal with an event like this than any other medical examiner's office in the country. And the response that we saw from those first responders um, after losing over 400 of their own um, between the law enforcement officers and the police, and the work they did at Ground Zero, uh, I I can't say enough good things about them. Uh, One thing to mention, uh, everybody that was recovered uh, at Ground Zero went through that temporary morgue facility unless they were a member of service. If a fireman or policeman was was discovered, they were immediately taken to the medical examiner's office uh, with the ceremony that would have been appropriate for their recovery. So um, they were recovering their own uh, as, as they served. We saw, and I'll never forget, the images of all the soot and the dust and and the rubble and everything. What was it like working in that environment? I can remember um, arriving just across the Hudson River in the early morning hours of September 13th. We were originally going to fly, and as you remember, um, everything was shut down. Uh, There were no planes leaving, and so the government rented vans and transported us uh, in some vans from various port points around the country to uh, to New York but we arrived there our group did on the morning of the 13th and the concrete dust and smoke uh, was clearly visible from probably 15 20 miles away um, we were going through ground zero later that afternoon and when I approached it on a four-wheeler I just could not come to grips with what I saw um, again uh, the toxic dust and, and smoke that those guys were dealing with um, it was clear, you know, was not a healthy thing for them. But again, there was a job that needed to be done, and they were getting the job done. Well, what, what were some of their comments? What What did they talk about, or what do you talk about, during, if anything, during a time like this? You know, I think there was very little discussion being had. Um, everybody was so emotional uh, and doing what they could to control their emotions and simply get the job done. Um, I can remember uh, the temporary morgue facility was set up in the uh, ground floor of a, a school. And I can remember one day walking in to the upper floors of that school where the cafeteria was and seeing all the plates still set on the tables. Those children had been at breakfast uh, when that first plane hit and they were evacuated and those plates still sat there. And I thought how close those children came to being victims. Um, So things like that continued to you know, play at your emotions and so I think we can all came home with a lot of that bottled up inside us we just didn't talk about it a lot 
we'll take another break and then we'll come back and i, I really want to kind of dig down uh into uh, the families sure because this is what you know really is the thrust here and uh, we're on Facebook Live if anybody has any questions or comments. And we'll be back with more of Brian Hightower as we remember 9-11 after these words. Health is a journey. It's making better choices, even when it's not easy. It's taking care of yourself and the people you love. At Tanner Health System, we're there for you with every step, with primary care, heart care, cancer care, women's care, orthopedics, surgical services, and so much more. We're dedicated to helping you live and feel your best. So let's get on that journey to health. You've got places to be for many years to come. Find us at Tanner.org. I'm Michael Flynn, Oak Mountain Academy, class of 1978. Katie Flynn, class of 2010. Justin Flynn, class of 2014. Logan Flynn, class of 2019. And I'm Marnie Flynn, current teacher at OMA. My uncle Richard Orm Flynn, a founding father of Oak Mountain Academy, had a vision to see students become confident leaders who hold a faith-based value system in an academically rigorous environment. We are proud to celebrate 60 years of fulfilling my uncle's vision. Our family invites you to visit the campus or oakmountain.us today. Good morning. Welcome back to the Community Voice. I'm Steve Gratt, your host. We're thankful that uh, Brian Hightower has agreed to come in and kind of reflect upon uh, 9-11. He was up there for three months immediately after the uh, terrorist attack. Um, in, in the work that your lifelong work and, and that of your family, um, dealing with grief and dealing with families, going through grief, um, it is a wonderful gift and a, 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 and a specialty that uh, average Joe Blow like me has no concept of. But it's hard to imagine what it would have been like dealing with families who in an instant lost a loved one to something they didn't understand, probably didn't even really have never heard about Osama bin Laden. Um, tell us about working with uh, consult, consulting, consoling the the families of the victims. Yeah, the the one of the first jobs I had uh, when we arrived in in New York uh, again was with the Family Assistance Center, and we were first tasked with interviewing um, the families of the uh, the victims on the airplanes. And again, because of the travel ban that had been put in place and the the airway airlines had been shut down, uh, all those interviews were done over the phone. So that made it much more difficult uh, to carry on those kind of conversations. Uh, you know, normally you'd, you'd like to be sitting across the table from someone and be able to make eye contact and support them in a physical way as well. Um, so we would conduct those interviews and, and oftentimes get to a point where the people simply couldn't talk about it anymore. And that's when you'd terminate the interview and ask if you could contact them again. And so, again, there were several of those families that I talked to a number of times, and you could just hear the pain in their voices because, as you said, they, they simply didn't understand what had happened, why this had happened. Mm -hmm. And and it was the same way for the members of, of DMORD. I mean, the, the other events we had responded to, hurricanes and the like, we knew why we were there. It, it, it made sense in our minds, but this event was so senseless and, and so cowardly that it made it very difficult for us to understand, you know, why we all had to be there and why this tremendous loss of life had to occur. When you were doing those interviews, you were extracting uh, information to, uh, also. And you tell a story about uh, about a wedding ring, and I'm sure there are plenty of those type stories that where you were able to connect the dots, if you will. Absolutely, yeah. There was a, an interview I was doing with a lady, and um, there was um, – we ask questions and we gather anti-mortem information. This is information before the person died. And it's it's questions like what color hair did they have? What color were their eyes? Uh, how tall were they? How much did they weigh? Did they have any identifying marks? Do they wear any specific jewelry? What kind of clothes did they have on? Those kinds of questions. So there's a recovery is made and you gather post-mortem information. You, you feed that information together and hopefully you eliminate and begin to narrow down the scope. And in this particular interview, she said her husband only wore one piece of jewelry, and it was his wedding band. 
and it was inscribed on the inside with her name and the date of their marriage. So as I'm sitting at the medical examiner's office with a team of detectives, we were charged with taking those anti-mortem information and the post-mortem interviews and trying to combine those and narrow the field. And the post-mortem information was being fed to us from the medical examiner's office downstairs as the bodies were recovered. So I had done that interview myself, which was odd, but one day across my desk comes this post-mortem interview or post-mortem examination, and it indicated there was a wedding ring and there was an inscription. So I went, was able to go back and find the interview I had done with this lady, and we were able to make an identification um, based on that ring. Now, that, that didn't make the positive identification, but it allowed them to narrow the scope down enough that they were able to do DNA to make a final determination and, and final um, identification of that individual. So, so the ring put us on the right path. And so that we were able to recover uh, that gentleman and his remains were able to be returned to his wife. And it was, it was stories like that that made you feel at least like there was a purpose in you being there. You referenced the, uh, the guys who were on the rubble, fire department, uh, police department. Some have experienced horrific health effects as a result. But these were the guys that were actually retrieving the remains. You, you speak of this woman with the wedding ring, but but they were going through that. Absolutely, absolutely. They they along with the equipment they were using were clearing debris and recovering remains. How those guys and yourself, for that matter, were human beings, and y'all were separated, volunteering many uh, from your families. How did y'all? mentally and emotionally i mean i'm sure there must have been times you just wanted to break down and yeah I, you know it, it it was pretty easy to get emotional um and we were working seven days a week 12 hour shifts and so most of the time you to be real honest you were exhausted um but i i had three smaller daughters at the time um three small daughters at the time and left my wife and three children here and there were a lot of days you needed to be around them. You needed the comfort and console of your family, but they simply weren't there. So that separation made it more difficult for us. And then for them, you know, with us being away, it made it very difficult for them as well. So, you know, our families went through some sense of separation, much as those who lost their loved ones did. But they went through that on a very temporary basis, knowing we'd be coming home, which is what made it easier for us to get up every morning and go back to doing what we were doing because we knew there was a goal there was there was a there was a job to be done and we were hoping to accomplish that we you know it's hard i don't think anybody can really truly imagine you know two two thousand nine hundred ninety seven of course that included the fire service and law enforcement officers but that's an extraordinary number um as they say i, I think it was the largest uh uh, death of Americans in one single incident uh, exceeding uh, Pearl Harbor. But um, we see in the smaller disasters that uh, be it uh, a flood or, or drowning or, or some sort of criminal action, family members coming in and they want answers. They want them now and they're distraught and they're screaming and I assume you had some of that, correct? If not a lot of it, we we did have some of that. And and one thing that we were able to do uh, as we did the interviews, especially with those families with their loved ones on the airplanes, as you can remember, there was a lot of information and some disinformation coming out after that event. And we were able to share, you know, our cell phone numbers with these families. So a lot of times they would reach out to us if they heard something in particular. They would reach out to us. And oftentimes we, we didn't certainly have the answers, but we could try to find an answer for them um, because they, they simply wanted to know. They wanted information. Um, they were starved for it. Uh, they wanted to be very, you know, very much, they wanted to be in New York, closer to their loved ones. I imagine But so. they couldn't get there. Yeah. And so we were at, at times that conduit for them. Um, I had uh, a family that I dealt with who lived in Miami, uh, who lost a loved one on the airplane. And at the time we were doing these interviews, we simply didn't know what the recovery might look like. We didn't know whether those remains would be recoverable or not. And certainly there was questions based on the intense heat and fire that was involved. But this family so badly wanted um, their loved one to be recovered that once the air uh, lanes were open, uh, this lady got on her family's private jet, put some 
items in a baggie and delivered those to me in D.C. And because I had talked to them, it, I was a, a, an underling, certainly, in this whole event. But she wouldn't, ret- she wouldn't give them to anybody but me because I had talked to her four or five different times on the phone. And she said, no, we'll give them to you. Uh, we know you. And we, well, they didn't really know me, but, but they didn't know anybody else but me. Um, and I was able to pass those on to the ME's office. But that's how desperately people you know, wanted information and wanted their loved ones back. Um, I, I, I very seriously doubt there was ever a recovery made of her loved one, but but they were willing to do whatever they could do to try to help make that happen. You, you've mentioned several times the ME office, the medical examiner's office, and I believe you've said previously that they were super professional. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, the, the ME's office in the city of New York um, – Again, I, I don't know of anywhere else in the country that could have handled the influx of uh, of death that they did as professionally as they did. Um, because keep in mind, while crime was certainly down in the city of New York after 9-11, there were still those other deaths that had to flow through the ME's office in addition to the, the loss of life from the, the, the terrorist event. But they were able to do all of that uh, with the assistance of D. Morton and, and others. Um, in a very professional manner, and uh, I, I couldn't I couldn't sing their praises any higher. Um, how, how important is it, in your opinion, that not only for the families but for our own uh, mental health, if you will, that uh, we remember nine eleven. I think 9-11 is one of those events that helped shape this country going forward. Uh, you know, our country was forever changed as a result of 9-11. Um, and I, I think that it's important that future generations understand it and remember it. Um, I think there is, you know, certainly uh, a willingness on the part of a lot of people to try to forget it because it was a horrific event. We don't want to, we don't want to uh, sometimes remember those things that cause us pain and angst. Um, but I think if we don't remember it, uh, some of the mistakes that may have been made and some of the events that led up to it are liable to happen again. And I think those 2,977 people deserve to be remembered. We want to thank you for coming in uh, this morning and sharing your remembrances and your thoughts and, and giving us information that you know that we uh, maybe had not been privy to and. I agree. It's important to remember, and and that's part of the grieving process. Absolutely. So our gratitude and uh, thanks and honor to Bryant Hightower. God bless you, sir. Thank Thank you, you, Steve. You and your work, and thank you for being such a community leader. Thank you. And we thank you for listening uh, here to the Community Voice, brought to you by Tanner Health System and Oak Mountain Academy. Uh, Tomorrow morning, we have the president of Georgia Right to Life in the studio, and I hope you'll join us then. It's a Monday morning. Go out and make it a great day. You're in tune to WLBB Carrollton.